so much for coming tonight. Take a little bit of time out of your evening to join me. This is a seminar that's going to be on software-defined networking. This is a brand new way to build networks. If you know a little bit about how we do networks today, that's going to serve you very well tonight. If you don't know anything about how we do networks today, don't sweat it. We'll cover that. And we'll talk about why this brand new way of building networks is better, quicker, faster than the old way. Now this stuff is cutting edge. Okay, what we're going to be talking about tonight is actually uh, technology that is available in products that you could buy today, but it's early on. If you look around, you're not going to find a lot of SDN-based networks out there. You're going to find a lot of companies that are experimenting with SDN networks. They're poking around the corners. They're taking a look and seeing if this is something that is going to have some value for them. The most important thing is that you're going to see companies like AT&T, which operates one of the largest networks out there, issuing RFPs to their vendors saying, this is the direction that we plan on going. Tell us about the products that you have that are going to help us go in this direction. Remember, AT&T is a very, like a super tanker, right? It takes 10 years to sort of turn the boat around and stuff like that. So the fact that they're making those types of statements to their vendors today indicates that that's their plan for going forward tomorrow. So this stuff has legs, okay? And you'll, as we go through this, you'll start to understand where the true power of SDN comes from. And you'll also understand why companies like Cisco and Juniper are so concerned about it, okay? Now, concerned means that they see it as a threat to their financial income. Concerned means that they will be taking and are taking active steps to squash it. Okay? So there's an exciting battle going on in the world of computer networking today. What used to be fairly cut and dry, build a network, go get some Cisco routers and you're done, has suddenly sort of been turned on its head. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So we have, as we go through this, first off, there's cookies in the room. If you don't have cookies in front of you, you've failed. You need to go get more cookies. When you finish the cookies that you have, go get more cookies. Because I do not want to be going home tonight with any cookies left on that plate. If I, if I do, you failed me. And you don't really want to do that because I'm very emotional about this. Uh, as we go through tonight's presentation, if you have a question, please ask it. Okay? I would like this to be as interactive as we possibly can. I have information that I'd like to share with you. But if you have a question, ask it. And I'm sure it will benefit everybody in the room. That sound like a fair deal? Yep. All right, SDN, this changes everything. Let's have a talk about what we're talking about, shall we? Okay, I have three goals that I'd like to accomplish during our time tonight. The very first goal that I have is I would like to share with you what SDN is. Maybe a little bit of the history, where it came from, and why it's such a big deal. The second thing I'd like to do is talk about Google. Google has done some amazing things already with SDN. They are truly a pioneer in this field. So I'd like to have a little talk about what they've done. And I'd like to wrap things up tonight by talking about what the future of SDN is. Once again, this is a new technology. It's not established. There are not a lot of books written about it. There's not a lot of papers that have been presented on it yet. It's brand new stuff. So the future is by no means mapped out. But I hope I can give you a little bit of an insight into some of the different directions where some of the work is going. Sound like a fair deal? Three things. That's why I promise. If you get four things, well, congratulations, you got something. All right, so let's talk about SDN. So this is a little article that I clipped out of the Wall Street Journal. It says, what does it say? AT&T targets flexibility cost savings with new network design. Uh, new network design is software-defined networking. Okay? And what the article talks about is the fact that AT&T a gigantic, well-established telephone company that already has a built-out network is actively looking at software-defined networking technology. The question is, why? They've already got the network. Why would they borrow? Well, the reason is is because companies like AT&T end up having to rip out their network roughly every 18 months. So Cisco comes out with a new generation of routers that are quicker, better, faster, fancier software, whatever the story is. And so AT&T has to reach into the network, remove the gear that they put in there, buy the fancy new gear, and put it in. And they spend literally billions of dollars every year keeping their network current, okay? And that's sort of the way it's always been. 
Now, the smart, bright folks at at and have been keeping their eyes open. They are aware of software-defined networking. They understand that it's a completely different way of building your network, and that it holds the possibility of getting them out of this endless cycle of having to completely rebuild their network every year and a half to two years. And that has them incredibly excited. Good evening. You're in the right place. Sign in on my list. Sure. Grab one of those two pieces of paper. I got a pile of cookies back here. You need to grab some cookies before you sit down. Thank you. All right. All right. So, ATT is interested in this. I'm telling you that I'm going to talk to you about what Google is doing. These are names that you recognize. These are big companies. This trick this as what it is. It's a stamp of approval for this new technology. Let us go back to networking 101, shall we? We're going to go all the way back, so no matter how much you know about networking, don't worry about it. We're going to go back to the very basics. So this is a very simple five-node network. I've got five circles. Those circles are routers. I could go out to Cisco today and buy a circle from Cisco. I have five users represented by the little circles, labeled one, two, three, four, and five, is all the way over here, okay? Let's say that Mr. Five is Netflix. And let's say Netflix has a hot new copy of Avatar 2. Everybody wants to see Avatar 2. It's a great movie, I'm sure, whatever it is. So user one, two, three, and four say, listen, I need to connect to user number five so I can watch Avatar 2. Well, that sounds pretty good. So number one's gonna hook into router which will connect to router E, which will then connect to router F, and that's how he'll be able to talk to person number five, which is Netflix. And everybody else is going to do sort of the same thing. This happens a thousand times every day. Every time you log on, every time you go to a website, the same sort of things happen. So here we go. The dashed lines represent the connections. So you can see there's a red line that connects router B with user number four to avatar two, over here at router F. The green line connects router A to router F. And we've got, oh, let's say a purple line that connects router D to router F. So everybody has their connections. Everybody's sitting at home watching Avatar 2. Everybody's happy. Life is good. And this is the way that networks work today. Unfortunately, this is also the way networks work. So the link between router E and router F has just failed. Undoubtedly, there was a backhoe digging in somebody's neighborhood, and it just nicely clipped that cable. Pow! So that's gone. What's going to happen in the network? Router E is going to inform D and C that it can no longer talk to F. Sorry, can't happen. What's going to happen then is routers A, B, and D are going to go, hmm, well, that didn't work out so well. I have to rebuild my connection user number five. Now remember there's this link here that they can use, that link, and then that link up there. So there's three other links that they could potentially use in this network. Who will give them a chance to do that? Ooh. Yay! <laughs> Everybody tries to use this link. And the way it works in a network today is that's just too much. There's not enough bandwidth on this link to support all three of these users watching Avatar 2. So what's going to happen is whoever got there first, in this case, user number four, wins. They get to set up the connection. <coughs> These other users are informed, <coughs> not going to happen. You cannot actually use that path to connect to user number five. So they're going to have to go back, and they're going to have to try again. The good news in this network is that there's some other paths. They can actually build an alternate route between them and Netflix. All right. So we had a problem. We had a link failure. Uh, we ran around a little bit like a chicken with our head cut off. But basically, we rebuilt all of our connections. Life is good again, right? Or is it? So let's think about this for a moment. So when we try to rebuild the connection around the bat, remember at least three of our users ran into a problem where their initial attempt to rebuild it failed, right? Then they had to try again. So time passed. Not a lot of time, I mean, because we're talking about computers and stuff like that, but time did pass. 
Anybody here have a Netflix subscription at home? Anybody watch Netflix movies online? And what happens when Netflix can't get the data that you need? What do you see on the screen? It either it stops, or else you'll see a buffering or something like that. So these guys are hanging out watching the buffering signal. And how do you think that makes them feel? Not happy, right? You know how it is. You know, just in Avatar 2, when they're, well, I won't give it away, but let's just say it's the high point of the movie. Okay. Now the other problem is now we're rounding down these other paths. What do we actually know about those paths? We have some numbers which we're going to assume are like link bandwidth capacity. Okay, that's good. Band Apparently there's enough bandwidth for what we want to do. Are there other ways to describe other characteristics of connection besides bandwidth? Like latency, right? That can be an issue. And ability to tolerate burstiness. Sort of another one, right? And uh, you know, during the action scenes in Avatar 2, when there's a lot of stuff going on, that could be a, that could be a huge burst, right? And can these connections handle that? I have no idea, and nor do those users. Okay? So yeah, we rebuilt the connections, but we really don't know if we did a good job of rebuilding the connections. And that is the way things work in networks today. So life is okay, but life is by no means perfect, and it sure seems like things could be a little bit better. Okay. I have a question. Question, please. Yeah, are you suggesting that an enterprise or service provider network works the way you just described it? Yes, and I've simplified it. Oh, you okay. have made okay. Okay. There's a lot of other technologies, a lot of other routing protocols, a lot of other things that you can use. At a very high level, this is what occurs. There's other sophisticated algorithms, okay? And there is additional data about the network that can be offered. But this is the essence of what happens. Okay. Okay? Right. Okay. And the reason I say that is because we're going to talk about what software-defined networking is. So on the left is a Cisco Nexus uh, 5596T router. You can go out today, you can buy it from Cisco, okay? If you're going to buy that in your pocket, you better have $27,000. It is a sweet piece of hardware, okay? And the reason it costs $27,000 is that it has custom hardware on it. And that hardware grabs packets as they come in off the wire. As quickly as it possibly can, it figures out where that packet should be sent, and then it shoves it out the other side of the route. That's its reason for being. Now, if it knows where it's going, then it's a very simple thing to do. But it also runs a lot of very fancy software. Okay? And that fancy software talks to other Cisco boxes. It does management of itself. It knows how to react when there's link failures. Except, oh, it's got security built in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's why it costs $27,000. Okay? In the world of software-defined networking, you don't buy that box. Instead, you buy this one from a company called uh, Pika 8. This is their P3922 box. It costs $11,000, less than half that extremely fancy Cisco box. Okay? This one costs half as much. Good evening. Sign in, take two sheets, and you're good to go. Got a pile of cookies back here. Grab some cookies, too, please. The reason that that costs half as much because it has virtually no software on it. Okay? This over here is a Windows 8 box with a lot of Microsoft Office installed on it. This is an empty hard drive. Okay? And that's why it costs so little. Okay? So one of the core ideas behind software net and software defined networking is you pull the software off of the router. You have built a network made up of dumb routers. Now, mind you, this is completely 180 degrees away from how Cisco and Juniper do things today. They provide very sophisticated pieces of equipment, uh, high quality hardware with a lot of very complicated software on it. And SDN says, no, pull all that software off and put it on a centralized server in your network. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Everybody understanding what we're doing here? $27,000 for a Cisco router. 
beautiful, wonderful, works perfectly. $11,000 for an SDN router doesn't really do very much by itself. Okay, so let's talk about how computer networking is done today. This is sort of a quick snapshot of how you would build a router, okay? At a very low level, a router has specialized packeting, packet forwarding hardware. Fantastic silicon, okay? Arguably, you can now get generic silicon that does this. You know, so in the back, in the past, it was always Cisco and Juniper who made their own. You can actually go to Taiwan and get folks to do a very good job of this. Once again, silicon, your goal when you're building a router is you really, if you could get away with it, you would not want to involve any software at all. Because if you involve software, you're slowing things down, right? You would prefer to process your packets 100% in hardware. So the packets come in, you read the header, where are you going? And then you shove it out the port that will get it closer to wherever they're trying to go to. You've got a lookup table inside that says if I have a packet that comes in with a header that says 810, I should shove it out through port number 15. If I have something that comes in with a header that says uh, 512, I should shove it out through port number 7, right? And you try to do this as often as possible. Do me a favor to sign in, and I also got two handouts there, so grab both of them. And if you can grab those and do that in hardware, then you have hit the jackpot because you can do that extremely quickly. Okay? If you have to reference software, you can still do it, but you don't want to do that as often because that's going to slow things down. Sitting on top of this specialized hardware is an operating system. Cisco has a product called iOS, not to be confused with the Apple phones, but um, that is their operating system. Juniper has an operating system called Junos. This is truly their crown jewels. They have invested a great deal of money and energy ta engineering talent developing these. You've probably heard about some of the Cisco certifications you get, CCIS, CCIA, you know, all that sort of stuff like that. Effectively what they're doing in those training classes is they're teaching you about the Cisco operating system, okay, different aspects of it and stuff like that. On top of the operating system, you'll discover that routers run applications. I mean, this is almost like a Windows or a Macintosh computer, right? But they're running very specialized applications. Generally, these are routing applications, okay? Uh, BGP, uh, OSPF, um, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. It depends the technology, it depends the type of network you're trying to build and stuff like that. But all the fancy stuff is up there. All the security applications are up there. So there are actually applications running on top of an operating system that runs on top of the specialized hardware. Any questions about how you build a router today? It's relatively standard stuff, right? And Cisco and Juniper have made an incredible amount of money doing this. Okay? This is another sort of shot of exactly the same sort of thing. We, once again, let's go down to the data plane. Once again, we're operating the hardware level here. We've got the transceivers that are receiving and sending the actual packets themselves. We've got the switching ASICs. So remember, this is the hardware logic that says if I see a header that's 810, I shove it out port number 15. Okay. There's a management plane which sort of matches the control plane to the data plane. Up in the control plane, we'll have some flash code, we'll have some memory. Basically, that's if there's any software to be done, that's where we're going to be storing it. Sort of a three-level architecture for building a router today. Basically, you know, this is just in a nutshell sort of how we built everything that runs on the internet today. So we've got applications like email and uh, a phone over the internet and stuff like that. That's all built on top of a reliable or unreliable transport layer, um, SMP, HTTP, et cetera, et cetera. Best effort, global packet delivery, TCP, UDP. Best ever local packet delivery, now down to IP level. And then we get down to local physical transfer of bits, which is copper, fiber, or radio. So that's effectively how we're getting from one end to another. Remember, it's all been layered on top of each other. That's motherhood and apple pie when it comes to understanding how the internet works. So if we take that same concept and now we apply it to a router, this is what a router looks like in the world of software-defined networking. Over on the left-hand side, that's the data plane. We've taken a lot of the things that were spread across the three planes in the traditional picture, and we scrunched them all down and stuck them in the data plane. We have the transceivers, we have the switching ASICs, we have a CPU, we still have a little bit of flash code and memory, but there's not much there. There's not much software running on an SDN router. A little bit, but not much. What we've done is we've taken all of the smarts and we've moved it over here. And this SDN controller, think of it as a high-powered server. 
go to Dell, buy their fanciest server, load it with as much memory as you possibly can, and stick it in the middle of your network. And that's where you're going to run your SDN controller. This is an important piece of software because it's going to be controlling your entire network. Sir, what was the rationale behind it? Behind doing this? Yes. There's several different reasons. First off, it reduces my network, cost of building my network dramatically. Okay? So I do have to pay for this software. What's interesting about the software is right now, I can get this open source. You're familiar with open source? Effectively free and available software. I can buy this as, a, as an open source. Now, I mean, I can also buy it from a company and get better support and stuff like that. But now, this is my $11,000 router. Remember, my alternative is to buy the $27,000 router. If I'm AT&T, how many routers do I have in my network? Thousands, uh, maybe a million routers. If I can cut my router cost in half or more, I mean, immediately, immediately I'm going to save money. But here's where things get even crazier. Because remember, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning. AT&T has to replace their Cisco or Juniper routers roughly every 18 months. Okay? Because they come out with a newer, better, faster, quicker one, right? Just after you get it installed, you have to pull it out. Okay? In this case, I put a dumb router in my network. There's no software here. All the software is here. To upgrade my network, all I have to do is get a new piece of software running here. And all of a sudden, whatever new functionality I want to introduce to my network is there and is available to all of my dumb routers. So that you know, year and a half to two year replacement cycle, gone. I don't have to do that. Okay? And so there's a few other things, but those that's the essence of it. So SDN is a completely different way to build a network, but the financial drivers for it are huge. The technology is pretty cool. And the technology, I think hopefully we can all, as we get through this presentation, we can all go, yeah, you know, I could, I could sort of see some advantages to that. But you know what's interesting? When it comes to making a decision as to whether or not a company goes with it, uh, the chief financial officer probably is going to make the real decision, right? Hi, we can spend you know the two billion dollars we spend every year on equipment, and by the way, next year spend two two and a half billion dollars, or we can spend maybe one and a half billion dollars this year and spend maybe half a billion dollars next year. Well, pff, I'm going with that second plan, right? Because I'm saving so much money. So, uh, a little while ago in the world of IT, there was outsourcing. Of Right, where jobs were taken from the from you know, local jobs were taken and moved to the, like a foreign country where other people would do it for like less money and stuff like that. You know, whether or not you agreed with it or not was an interesting question, but it didn't really matter because it made so much financial sense. Pretty much every company did it. Right, you just couldn't stop them at that point. Same thing here. This makes so much financial sense to implement software-defined networking in your network. I believe you're going to see everybody doing it. Okay, and you're going to see a lot of vendors showing up. So let's talk, we're going to run through this here. Let's take a look at another network. So this is a very, very simple network. It's five nodes. Those nodes are interconnected. They're certainly not, every node is not connected to every other node. But if you had to get from one end of the network to the other end of the network, you could do it. There is a path. So we can go ahead and add a little bit more information here. Okay, so you can see that there's some routing algorithms running that are helping us do it. What's interesting about the routing algorithm that's running in this particular network is it's what's called a distributed algorithm, okay? So this node's gonna run a little bit of it, and this one's gonna run a little bit, and this and so on, and really nobody has a complete view of the network, right? Everybody has a view of their portion of the network, and they'll all communicate with each other trying to share information to help the other guys do a better job, right? Uh, so it's a complicated task specific. And SPF, which is shortest path first, is a very, very common algorithm that you'll find running in networks and stuff like that. So you know, this is a, sort of a typical view of a network today. Okay, SDN changes everything. So SDN lays a layer of software on top of the network, sort of a network operating system. And the network operating system will communicate with every single dumb router in that network, okay? What it's gonna do is it's gonna use that information to build a global network view. So the operating system is going to have a map of the network. The operating system is going to understand how each router in the network is in interconnected, okay? 
once the network operating system has that information, you can build control programs. Now, the control programs are the fancy, sophisticated routing programs. They're the security programs. They're the management programs. And instead of actually interacting with the routers in the network, what they're going to interact with is the, the model, the view of the network that has been built by the network operating system. So, and this is the exciting part about SDN. What it means is you can write a program to program the network. Your program is going to modify the model. Once you modify the model, then the network operating system is actually going to reach out to the routers in the network and change their configuration. So this is something we've never been able to do before. It's the concept of network programming. You have this model of the network, and your program modifies the model, and then there's software that actually relates that modification back into the network and makes it happen. Okay? Do we really understand what this means? No. We get excited about the idea. Wow, that's groovy. That's really cool. Do we really know what it means? Ah, not quite yet. Okay? But we needed some really smart Russian missile scientists to show up and do something that we've never been able to do before. And that we're, we're in that era. And that will be happening. Sir, question. How will Tor be integrated with this? How will Tor, right. which is the anonymous, um, it would actually be, uh, it's not necessarily in the routing algorithm, per se, of the network. Tor works on endpoints, right? Or else it's a server application. So it's actually operating at a much higher level. We're just talking about how you build your network here. Tor works on the endpoints end of the network to uh, anonymize both users and receivers and stuff like that. So it will be outside of it. So really, you won't have a role to play in this. Got it? But eventually, we'll have to. Or it eventually goes away. It, once again, it's an application. Tor is an application. Okay. So there's no problems with that whatsoever. It's just it's not part of how you design the network. still ride the Provide a transport, however. It, yeah, it. so once again, it, but the network will treat Tor just like anything else. They'll treat it like uh, Netflix, they'll treat it like network backup, they'll treat it like any other application <coughs> running on it. Nothing special, right? So, well, if, if, if Tor has a profile, the orchestration of the network based on the separation of the data plane and the control plane, then you could prioritize it. If you decide that you want Tor to be important within your network, then the orchestration within the control plane of your controller, you could do that. So Tor's profile, whatever application profile you is could, there, that. No, that's a very good point. Okay, so the, the, what he was saying is that you could prioritize Tor traffic over other things. 100% agreement on that one. But where that will become interesting is when you have a heavily loaded network <coughs> and you have limited bandwidth, you have to make decisions about who you give bandwidth to. If you did that, then as a Tor user, congratulations, your stuff's still going through. And maybe somebody else's isn't, right? So no question about that. You are correct on that. Uh, you know, is it significant? I don't know. You know I, I, I don't believe Tor applications are generally a bandwidth intensive applications. I think they're text files and stuff like that, right? So uh, once again, but yes, you certainly could do it. All right. So here's another view. Okay, so just another SDN example. User A does not want any of his packets routed through user B. Uh, user B is uh, Libya. I don't want any of my packets going through Libya. Just to give you an example. Well, in today's network, oh dear God, you have what a pain in the butt, right? You're going to have to tell each one of these nodes, don't let A's packets go through B. Everyone's going to have to have that rule programmed into it. So when they receive uh, information from A, don't run it towards B. Can it be done? It certainly can. Complex? Yes. Can you make mistakes? Oh, yeah. That many nodes, all that sort of stuff like that, things can get complicated pretty quickly. The reason the SDN is so cool is because in the world of SDN, the network sort of looks like this. And all you really have to do is worry about the endpoints. So once again, remember, we're back up at that control plane, right, where we're doing the network programming stuff. What we do is we say, hey, A doesn't want any of their packets to go to B. Pretty simple, right? We're going to worry about the network operating system telling all the routers what they actually have to do 
But at our control plane level, we view the network as an abstract. It's really pretty simple stuff. Packets from there, don't go there. Pow, end of story. Not terribly complicated to do, right? Now hopefully you're also understanding there's some sophisticated software here, right? But it's running in the background. From your point of view, as a network programmer person, or somebody who's developing a network application, this is how you view the network. It is that simple, okay? And this is a dramatic change from the way things are done today. In a Cisco network today, you have to worry about every single node. You have to figure out how everything's going. There's a lot more that you have to take into account. You really can't write applications that deal with the network as a whole. You can write an application that deals with box by box, yes, but not the network as a whole. Now we're allowing you to deal with the network as a whole. Got it? All right. So now we're back to sort of the massive view of what's going on. What I have mentioned is that there's another layer. There's a virtualization layer. So if I reach out and I connect to each one of the routers in the network and build this sort of network view, one of the challenges with that is that network view is going to be relatively sophisticated. I'm going to have a lot of information about each one of these routers, which is great from a technical point of view, but it's probably too much to present to the upper layers. So that control plane doesn't need to know as much about the routers as the network OS does. So I'm going to put a virtualization layer in between. And what the virtualization layer is going to do is it's going to sort of, uh, wrong way to say it, but you'll get the gist of it, dumb it down. It's going to hide a lot of the complexity of that network. And it's going to present a much more simplistic or virtual view of the network to the control plane. Remember, in the control plane, that's where the really smart software developers are writing their programs that are going to manipulate the model of the network. Okay? And what we want to do is we want to make that model as simple as possible for those guys. We want to provide them enough information, certainly, so they can do their job and they can work whatever fantastic magic they're going to work. But we don't want to burden them with too much information. So we'll hide that information in the network OS. We'll use the virtualization layer to map between sort of the abstract view and the super detailed view. So when the control program applications make a change to their virtual network, you get this goes to the virtualization layer, it goes to the network OS, and then it actually goes out, and we actually change the routers. Got it? So it's software, software, software. You getting this? There's a lot of software here. There's no question about that. Uh, Software-defined networking, I mean, the very first word in the title is software, right? But here's the thing. You get this down. You get this in place. You build your network using this, and it's done, right? You get to spend all of your time up at the control program level, where you're dealing with this abstracted view of the entire network. And if you can see, if your control program, whatever it is, can see the entire network, and if it's not being crushed with too many details, you can do some amazing things. All right, so this is a, I apologize, because this chart's a little bit busy, <coughs> but let's sort of step through it for just a brief moment here. There is, um, this is the cost of network equipment. What you should see is that the cost of net, whoa, no, no, I'm sorry, right here. This is cost of network equipment right here. What you should see is that the cost of the equipment is going up every year, Cisco gear and Juniper gear, it gets better. Quicker, better, faster, more sophisticated. But guess what they do with their price? They raise it up, right? Now, here's how much the phone company is making from you and me. So they're making more money every year from you and me. Hey, I'm sorry, your phone bill goes up, your internet bill goes up, your cable bill, they all go up, right? But they can't raise it too much, otherwise what are you gonna do? Right, screw it, I'll just stream it from Netflix when it becomes available, right? Yeah, you'll, you'll drop it if they make it too expensive. The problem is, is that the difference between this line and this line is actually getting smaller. So in other words, the cost of the network is actually rising at a greater rate than the telephone company is drawing money out of your and my wallet. And that makes them sad. <laughs> they go, listen, we can't, we can't keep doing this. We've got to change something, which is why AT&T, Verizon, Sprint are so interested in SDN. See, if I want to put SDN into the network, this is how much it's going to cost me. 
Notice that that's a lot less than how much I traditionally play for all that Cisco and Juniper gear. Remember 11,000 versus 27,000? Okay. Now here's the one that really opens up my eyes. This is potentially how much money I could make if I put SDN into the network. Now, it's a little bit of a, of a made up thing, but the concept is, is if I have this software defined network and I have that control plane and I can program my network, man, I can do an awful lot with software in my network. Today I really can't. I can do some management stuff and I can set up connections and take connections down. But arguably that's sort of it for what I can do. If I have a network in which I have this model and I can program that model and change things at will, network wide, wow, you know, the sky's the limit as far as the fancy, sophisticated applications that I can come up with. You know, one example, of course, would be I give you one phone number. And wherever you happen to be located, I'm gonna make sure that your phone rings. If you're out of the house, I'll make sure your cell phone rings. If you're at home, I'll make sure that your home phone rings. If you're on your laptop, I'll make sure that your laptop rings, okay? If you're not there, I'll grab the message, I'll turn it into a text message, and I'll send it to you. I'll turn it into a, you know, an audio message, and I'll, I'll send it to your, uh, I'll call you on your cell phone, to make sure you get that. I'll send it to you as an audio file if you want to. I can do all sorts of very sophisticated things like that, but I can only do that if I can program a network. If I can figure out where you are, figure out where my network is, and somehow get those things to work together. Everybody getting this? Expensive to own an operated network. It's getting worse if I don't do anything. SDN offers apparently a low cost way to completely rebuild my network, and there's a potential that I can make a truckload of money with SDN applications. So work. If there is an entry point, and there is a fixed cost to make an entry point on this, what size network can you be at with this technology for the payback to be there? Gotcha. And, and so that's a great question. So the question is, <clears throat> yay, I've, I've drunk the, uh, the SDN Kool-Aid, and I've decided, great, that's what I want to do. My problem is I already have a network, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how do I make that switch from today's old network to tomorrow's shiny new network, and when does it make sense? What size of the network does it make sense because there's a high fixed cost that you have to overcome? You're exactly right. Now, the simple answer to that is if I'm building a new portion of my network, I do an SDN, right? Now, that, that's a simple one. The problem, where it gets a little bit more sophisticated is what if I have an old network and I want to, you know, do I keep, do I stick with it and just say, ah, that's the way it is? Or do I actually bite the bullet and go ahead and convert it? I think every company probably has a different answer for that. But Google is going to provide us at least a partial answer. So let's take a look at this. So the reason that we're going to talk about Google is because, well, what do we know about Google? Uh, search engine. They make their money off of advertising. So does Google have a little bit of money or a lot of money? They've got a lot of money, right? Now, the interesting thing about Google is Google is very aware of what it takes to run their business. Google has two WANs, or wide area networks, that they use to run their business. One is called the, uh, uh, I think it's called the iWAN, which is for internet. And that's the, the network that they own and they maintain that you and I use when we access Gmail, when we access Picasso, when we access Google Hangouts, Whenever we, or Google search for that matter too, right? Whenever we access a Google service, service it's served off of their iWAN. They have another WAN called the GWAN. I actually, I think it's called G-Scale. G-Scale. It's like the Google one. That is an internal network that they use. And they use that network to interconnect their data centers. Google, because they've been around for a while and because they are so large, has data centers sprinkled all over the globe. And they have a need for those data centers to exchange information as part of our searches, as part of their network backups, as part of the storage of all the photographs and all the other sorts of things that we store on Google and stuff like that. They are constantly moving information between those data centers. In April of 2012, the vice president for Google engineering went to a conference. And he got up behind the podium and he said, hey, about this SDN stuff that everybody has been talking about, I'd just like to let you know that Google has gone ahead and implemented this. And at that point in time, you could have heard of his problem, right? So SDN was an academic concept. People were talking about it at universities. They were debating 
you know, some people said, wow, this crazy thing since sliced bread. Some people said, that's never going to work. There's so many drawbacks to it. It would never coexist in a world with the way we do networks today and stuff like that. And, you know, people were kicking around maybe doing a pilot project in the university on a test network. And he showed up and he said, guess what? The network that we use to interconnect all of the Google data centers worldwide is now running on an SDN network. We built it ourselves. What made this even more impressive, so this is roughly uh, two years ago at this particular point in time, there were no SDN vendors. You can't go buy an SDN router then, right? So Google had to build, had to spec and build their own routers. And Google had to build and write their own software. So it's even more amazing that they did this. But because they did it, it answered a lot of the questions. Well, I don't know if anybody can do this. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, you can. I don't know if a big company can do it. Yeah, you can. And to answer your question, hey, could I convert an existing network into an SDN network? Yes, you can. Easy? No, absolutely not. A tough and a danger, dangerous thing to do, right? Notice that Google did their network that interconnects all their data centers. That's the less important network. The more important network is the one that connects all the Gmail and all that sort of stuff going on, right? So they, they I mean, they, they manage the risk. But let's talk about what Google did and how they did it. So the reason that Google was willing to take this risk and actually go ahead and make these changes is because they took a look at how they were spending money. Admittedly, they've got a lot of money. But hey, even they are careful about how they spend their money. And they took a look and said, look, we can basically break the cost of our network, of our wide area network, up into three groups. Hardware, over-provisioning, and basically human labor. So hardware was routers, transport gear, and fiber. That's where they were spending their money. Over-provisioning, because remember, you have to, you know, if I need 10 megabits, I'm probably going to have to provision 30, 40, or even 50 megabits just in case something goes wrong. I need to have a backup path, right? Shortest path routing, slow convergence time, need to maintain service level agreements or SLAs, no matter you know, how many failures you have in the network. And you know, by the way, they treated all their traffic the same. And when you're interconnecting data centers, that's a huge deal because interconnecting data centers, you're doing a lot of backups. And backups are important, but they're not nearly as important as like user traffic or something that you're doing in real time. You can do a backup, you know, at 3 a.m. and wait for Right? You can be doing a backup, you know, by the way, something more important comes around, stop the backup, take care of the more important, and then start the backup again. But in the Google network that existed, they had, all traffic was the same, so they really couldn't tell the difference. So, and then uh, down here, Google had a very sophisticated way of managing their servers. Remember, we think, nobody knows, we think Google easily has over a million servers do all their searches and do all that sort of stuff like that. We think they probably have over a million servers in their network. Nobody knows for certain. But Google has put in such sophisticated tools that they're a, that adding more servers doesn't mean anything to them. Right? You just drop them in, it becomes part of the management system, and they go on. They manage their servers almost like a fabric is the way they've described it. Right? So if you add more servers, you just add it to the fabric, and it just becomes part of the uh, collective consciousness of Google. The problem was is their network was not that way. They were managing their network on a box by box basis. And it was killing them because their network was growing and becoming bigger and becoming obviously a bigger expense. Uh, I, I seem to remember reading an article about Google about the same time span in 2012 that they were moving all of their servers to 10 gig interfaces. And part of the reason, I, I heard a smattering of something about them doing uh, a new network design because of the cost of trying to hook those into and retrofitting all their routers up to 10 gigs is so high that the cost of server 10 gig NICs coming down and but the 10 gig NICs was still being very, very high for port. I did hear they were they were reaching out to somewhere in Taiwan to build their own router and exactly. stuff. And that's probably this time frame they were doing that. And you're exactly correct. They did build their own router. And you know you bring up an excellent point. There was probably multiple reasons for them making the change. It, it's never just one thing. But you're exactly correct. They did end up going to Taiwan. They did end up specking out exactly what kind of router they wanted to have. And they had somebody else build it for them. Which, of course, if you're the Cisco salesman, not going to Google the store. You're wondering why they're not returning your calls anymore, right? All right. So this is a situation that gave Google nightmares. And it gave Google nightmares for two reasons that we sort of skipped over last time. But the first one is, is when this failure occurs and you rebuild your connections, it's going to take time. 
right? And remember, you'll have conflicts and you'll have to redo and you'll have to reset and stuff like that. Google could not tell you how long it was going to take to recover from a link failure, right? They might be able to tell you the maximum amount of time, but they couldn't tell you on a per incident basis how long it was going to take to rebuild those connections, okay? The, uh, and then the other thing they couldn't tell you is they, if you have a link failure, I can't tell you what my network's going to look like after I rebuild them. You know, will the red link go down here? Will it go up there? Will it go all the way up there? Will the purple link be down here? Don't know. Remember, it's whoever gets here first gets this path. And depending on a whole bunch of very interesting things that are going on in the network, it could be anybody, right? So they had a non, here's, here's your 50 cent word for the evening, they had a non-deterministic system. So every time you have a link failure, your network configuration changes, but you don't know how it changes. And also you don't know if it's an op optimal solution by any stretch. And they hated that. Okay, when you're running a very sophisticated network that is the core of your business, you can't determine how long it's gonna to take to fix it, and you can't determine what the network's gonna look like after you fix it, you've got some major problems here. Everyone else lived with it, Google did something about it. What they did was they basically implemented SDN and they implemented a centralized traffic engineering function, which means that yellow box is now the smarts of the network. That yellow box reaches out to everybody. When you have a failure, the yellow box determines how the network should look after the failure. Remember, the yellow box can see the entire network end to end, so it makes really good decisions. It has all of the available information. And then what it does is when it figures out how the network should work, it goes ahead and it updates each one of those routers with the way it wants that router to behave. Once it does that, then the network works perfectly and all the right connections go in. So it knows green should go down here, red should go there, and purple should be on the top. That is the optimal solution for a network when you've had a link failure. And you know that because the yellow box has all the information. So it's not making its decision based on localized information, it's making its decision on the entire network of information. Make sense? That's a hell of a yellow box, by the way, <laughs> right? It's a very big, fast server, and it's some very sophisticated software. Can it be distributed? It can be. And in fact, you'd probably want to, right? You wouldn't want to have a single yellow box in your network. You probably want to have a couple of yellow boxes. Things get even weirder, right? Because as my network gets really, really, really busy, I'd probably want to have a whole bunch of yellow boxes. But as the network calms down in the middle of the night, I probably don't need so many yellow boxes. Right. So there's the concept of scaling up your yellow boxes and then also scaling them back down. Well, it's just combining any other company that you happen to absorb to do a select cluster or a super cluster would be so much easier than what they're trying to, if you try to implement two different uh, the similar networks now, it's a nightmare, it's very difficult. Exactly right. So if you have one built with Juniper or one built with Cisco and then those two companies come together, yeah, yeah good luck. Yeah, you're going to have two separate management consoles and all those. Uh, this is what Google's backbone network looks like, interconnecting all their data centers. Uh, you, basically, they're all over the world. Just a short answer on that one, even down in South America and stuff like that. So this was their internal backbone network. This is the network that they decided to convert from a traditional smart router network to an SDN network. This is sort of a quick snapshot of how it's set up. You've got a bunch of routers connected into the data center. You've got a lot of transport gear, connects over a WAN to some more transport gear, dumps it off into a router, and then delivers it to the other data center. Very traditional network sort of design. This is a real quick shot of, this is going back to the question that the gentleman in the back of the room answered. How did they do it? They had a fine network. It was working perfectly. Now they decided to go turn it into an SDN network. How did they do that? So they had their whole data center network here. On the edge, there's some cluster border routers, which are designed to talk to other data centers. It talks to basically the interconnection devices, and that all goes out to the transport gear. So that's just a really high level view of how a Google data center was set up. What they did was they implemented this fancy little server here that was running six different pieces of software. I need to look at my reference sheet because this is stuff. I don't know who names it, but they should be taken out. That is wrong talking to. Uh, Quag is actually it's a suite of network routing algorithms. Uh, you see you got open shortest path first, uh, routing information protocol, border gateway protocol, and ISIS for Unix systems. 
So basically, all those sophisticated routing algorithms that you can get in a Cisco box, basically available in open source software called Quad. Okay? Uh, OFC is the Open Flow Controller. This is a piece of software that's responsible for talking to the uh, SDN routers. You know those dumb routers? You know I've told you over and over again, it has very little software in it. It does have very little software. But one piece of software it does have is something that supports what's called the Open Flow Protocol. Open Flow is a very simple, relatively speaking, protocol that allows a router to figure out how to route packets. Now, it doesn't really do very much, and basically the controller tells it everything it needs to do. But the way the controller talks to the SDN router is using the Open Flow controller, uh, and OSC is what that is. Uh, Glue uh, allows an Open Flow controller to talk with the Quag application, so router, Glue, Quag, and then Paxos <coughs> is used to basically figure out who's in charge. When you have multiple devices doing the same thing, who's on top? And Paxos is just a particular piece of software that allows you, when you've got different boxes that are all doing the same thing, to figure out who's in charge, which turns out to be a really important question to answer. Do, right. they, do they have hypervisors in this system? Do they virtualize it? Okay, good question. I don't actually have any information on that. So let's think about this for a moment. Why would you virtualize it? You'd virtualize it if you wanted to be able to move it from box to box. You'd virtualize it if you wanted to run other things on the box. And neither one of those are germane in this situation. I want to dedicate that entire box to doing software-defined networking stuff. I want to free up all of its bandwidth just for that. I'm not anticipating moving that functionality to another box, right? So they, they could have. There's, there's absolutely no problems with that whatsoever. But there was probably no need to do that, and actually the additional overhead that it would take to support a, you know, cycles, it would take to support a virtual machine, may have actually taken away some of the processing that would have normally been available to this. So I can't actually say it, but I don't think there'd actually be a motivation to do that. Does that make sense? So within their data center, they can to their data centers. Right? Yes, that is correct. And therefore, they'll be moving around profiles and other things within the data center. In the data center, so yes. Uh, good question. It's a good question. So inside the data center, they have almost like a LAN, a local area network, right? What we're really talking about here is the, is the WAN, the wide area network. So the local area network will just talk inside the data center. But there'll be a few boxes that talk to the WAN, not all of them, right? And so we're really only talking about the WAN portion. So this is almost a standalone situation. So you might, I would suspect you probably virtualize every single server in that data center, but this is almost a separate beat. But you bring up a good point. If you virtualized everything else, maybe you just go ahead and virtualize this because you're just used to it. Second question on um, uh, Lava, I think it's uh -huh. the yeah. uh -huh. you know, the, the BGP, the OSPF, and all the other protocols are all the routing standards. protocols. Those are open, right? Yes. So therefore, they just basically uh, put them together on <coughs> one yes. software. Yeah. So the question is so what's going on in Quagga? So Quagga is a whole bunch of network routing protocols. And they are open, you know, they're an open standard. Okay, you can, you can pick up the book at any store. You can order it online. You have the specification for the protocol, okay? So somebody, some group of folks implemented it, and this is open source. This is freely available. You can go out today and download it, right? And what you get is a suite of network routing protocols, okay? All stuck together. Incredibly valuable, great stuff. Thank you very much for whoever did that. It's very kind of you to do it. But a whole bunch of them stuck in there, and then once you install that, you can use any one of those protocols from your network that you so choose to. Does that make sense? The world of open source software is fantastic. All right. I have a question. Yes, please. Can have links outside of your WAN network back to your server? So do you have to have a separate network? Yeah, yes. Yeah, your control plane back to your server that's running the so, API links? So I want to make sure I answer the correct or question. Is the network plane, the, the tie that ties the control plane to the network. Okay. Uh, sure, the fiber is, the same. Yes. is that a separate network that you use? It? So in this particular case, you see that there's a cluster border router, which is a very special device in the data center. 
if you wish to communicate on the WAN to like another data center, you can send your information to the cluster border router, okay? And then it'll shove it out the back door to another data center. When data comes in from the other data center, it will come into the cluster border router, which will then pass it into the uh, data center's LAN network, and it'll go to wherever it's got to go to. In the S, and so stay with me because we're going to go ahead and so let's go on a little bit and we'll come back to your question. Okay. okay. Let's just see if we touch base and get it taken care of. Otherwise, we'll move this. Yes, please. One small question. Huh? Within the data center, as you connect the WANs within multiple data center, we call it the interrupt. And applications that are coming from the data center, how are they managed? How do you prioritize the application as they go across the WAN? Um, let's come, good question. Let's, I, I, I have a partial answer for that, so we're going to come back to that one, okay? And you tell me whether or not I answer it. So let's go on just a little bit here. So this is what the good folks, engineers at uh, Google did. In this particular situation, they took half of the existing routers out, and they replaced them with SDN routers. So you have a hybrid environment here. You've got your Cisco routers, and then you've got your SDN routers, okay? And basically, they would throw traffic on one or the other, but once it was there, it would travel to the other data center on SDN, or it would travel to the other data center on Cisco, and the two would not intermix, okay? So it was a 50-50 solution. And then they kept their fingers crossed <laughs> that they hadn't done anything wrong. And it basically worked just fine. After they got that taken care of, they replaced the rest of the routers, right? So the gentleman in the back of the room had asked the question, how did they actually do this? This is the approach, and remember, different companies might do it differently. Uh, Google did a half and half approach. So they went in, in the middle of the night, they replaced half of their existing Cisco routers with these SDN ones, they fired it up, and made sort of a separate, made two different pathways between data centers, one on SDN and one on Cisco. Kept their fingers crossed, everything seemed to work out pretty good, everything was fine. And they went back in another night and they replaced all the remaining Cisco routers with SDN routers and turned it up. And then at this point in time, the interconnection between all the data centers was complete, completely based on the SDN. Uh, then after, oh, by the way, congratulations. A ton of work to get to this stage. And what have you done? The answer is nothing. This network operated exactly like the Cisco network. Okay? You have achieved absolutely nothing. But good news, you also didn't screw anything up, right? Yeah. What they did then was then they introduced a traffic engineering control program. And that's when the sophistication of SDN gets to work, right? They had a way to rebuild links, they had the ability to manage bandwidth, they had the ability to do a whole bunch of sophisticated things. This is when they got the real payoff for the time, energy, and effort that they put in. Uh, this just shows, oh, by the way, uh, in a typical data center, you're going to have, let's say, 10 applications. Those 10 applications are going to want to talk to each other. Each one of them is going to have a different amount of bandwidth that it would like to establish for that. Guess what? Sum it all up, and that's more bandwidth than you have available. Story of a life, right? Applications want to use too much bandwidth. Okay? Not a big deal. So this is the big picture for the Google data center. So I'm hoping this is going to answer your question. The way it works is, look, these are all your traffic sources. These are your applications. Right? What happens is they talk to what's called the bandwidth request collection enforcement module. This is how much bandwidth I would like to exchange with another data center. It says, fantastic, I appreciate that. Then it talks to a bandwidth bro broker. Bandwidth broker is like a cop. It says, how much do you want? What kind of application are you? Well, I'm a network backup application. Fantastic, you'll get that bandwidth in a couple hours. You won't necessarily get it right now. Or, I'm a network backup application. Hey, great, I've been watching you, and you said you were going to use five mega bandwidth, but you've been surging to like seven. I'm going to cut you off and give you two for a while. Right? So that's what the bandwidth broker does. Traffic engineering server then takes everything that it's told to do, passes it over to the gateway to the software defined networks, and then goes ahead and configures the network to support whatever these guys want you to do. So that's how Google configures their network. That's how they manage the bandwidth all the different applications they're using. And that's how they move from an existing network to a brand new SDN network. Any questions? Is there anything I haven't answered here? Did they have to reboot the SDN router? Did they have to reboot them? 
Well, when they installed them, they were off. So they hit power and turned but it off. Every time does it change the network? Here's the interesting thing. They don't have to change the routers. And the reason they don't have to change the routers is because the routers effectively have no software on them. There's nothing there to change. They have to change that big yellow box in the middle of the network. Yes. Because they'll upgrade that software and probably fairly frequently, right? They'll find bugs, they'll have new features. That, that, and actually, uh, Google's talked about that a little bit. They've got some very sophisticated software application management techniques that they use to manage software in their network. So I think they keep a hot version running, they install a cold version, bring it up, they swip over to the cold version, and then they take the hot version down. They're very sophisticated on this because they use it for Gmail, they use it for all the other sort of stuff. Uh, OpenFlow, I need to scoot along a little bit here. You see the controller, which is, in this case, I apologize, it's the big orange box, but it's really the big yellow box. Controller is that sophisticated piece of software that's sitting at the heart of your network. It sees the network, it knows the network, it's going to tell every single router what it should do. This is the router. The router has an OpenFlow channel, which is just simply designed so it can talk to the controller. It has group tables and flow tables. These are the ways it picks through a packet that's coming in, trying to see if it's seen that packet before. If it's seen the packet, it knows where it's going to go. If it's not seen the packet, then it needs to make some decisions. This is a fancy way of talking about how it makes the decision. Tables are used. I have a, a packet comes in. Its header is 805. Do I see it in table 0? No. Do I see it in table 1? No. Do I see it in table n? Yes or no? If it's no, potentially I'm going to throw it away. If it's yes, I'm going to say, hey, what do I do when I receive packets with the header of 805? Maybe it says make two copies and send it to two locations. Maybe it says send it to this particular location. It can be anything. I can program the switch to do whatever it's supposed to do with that packet. <coughs> this is just a sort of a decision matrix. Packet comes in. Do I have I already seen it before? If not, uh, then am I all done? If so, drop the packet. If I have seen it, then I gotta update some counters. Because here's a trick. There's almost an infinite number of packet header numbers. One, two, three, eight hundred, five, six thousand four. You know, I could uh, packet headers can be anything, right? If I have a packet header that I saw an hour ago and I haven't seen any other ones from there, I have a finite amount of space to save packet headers. To remember 500, packet number 506 gets sent out port number four. If I haven't seen anything from 506 for a while, and the counter hasn't been updated for a while, it's, it's time to clear it out, because I'm just not seeing any traffic from there. Because you have to manage your limited amount of space, okay? Go to table in, execute action set. So I can pick up a set of actions. Whenever you see that packet, you should do the following four things. So that's an action set, okay? So this, in a nutshell, is what an SDN router does. Look, there's not a lot of tables here. Not a lot of decisions to be made. It's really pretty simple stuff. Uh, this is talking about controllers. Remember, the big yellow box is a controller. There's three types of controllers you can have in an SDN network. Uh, first one is an equal controller, which is sort of the boss man. Boss man is control. That's fine. You can have a couple of equal controllers controlling the exact same SDN router. Okay, and they have to balance out what they're going to do. You can have something called a slave controller, which is sort of a read-only controller. It can see what's going in the router, but it really can't tell the router what to do. And your third choice is you can have a master controller. Master's in charge, slave controller's just reading, and the equal controller can make some changes, but not as many changes as the master controller. The master always wins. So remember, we talked about how the importance of a controller. I mean, it's really at the heart of the network. It turns out that you can have multiple controllers, and you can have different types. Okay, uh, the connection from a controller to a router, main connection, very important. There's no question about that. Uh, if there's a lot of stuff going on in the network, one connection isn't going to do it. So you can establish a whole bunch of connections between your controller and your router. But if you lose that main connection for whatever reason, all the other ones go away, just like that. Okay, once again, this is a bandwidth thing. If I really need to have talks with that router, I can set up a bunch of connections to do that. Make sense? Future. All right, let me skip through this one real quick. Uh, and this one, the, so a lot of the researchers are dealing with how do we move from where we are today with traditional networks to this grand and glorious SDN future. Uh, one of the things that they've come up with is what's called a dual stack. And you know, Google went through this for a little while, right, when they did their 50% replacement. So part of my network is SDN and part of my uh, network is legacy, right? They exist side by side, packets travel here or they travel there and they don't really get interchanged, right? I can live with that. Basically, when I build new stuff in my network, I'm going to make it SDN, but I'm not going to rip out the old stuff. The other one is called Access Edge. Basically, what I do is on the edge of my network, 
I go ahead and I put in SDN. And then I treat the center or the core of the network built with legacy equipment as sort of a blob, right? So the, uh, the SDN network just views it as a, as a one big honking router. It could be 100 or 200 different Cisco routers, I don't care. SDN views that as a single router, and then it does all its sophisticated stuff at the edge of the network. That's one approach to doing it. And then there's this other option called pan, pano, pano, pan yeah, yeah. easy for you to say, yeah. easy for you to say. But just on this one is they've done some interesting things. They've discovered that in a connection that has two endpoints, if one of those endpoints is an SD endpoint and the other one is a legacy one, you still get the benefits of an SDN network. So in this particular case, you can create a hybrid network that consists of both Cisco gear and also um, SDN routers. Mix it all together and you still get the benefit of the network. Uh, in this particular case, we're talking about uh, what's going on in individual uh, data center networks. What's interesting about data center networks, remember, we connect, interconnect data center networks using actually really big pipes because there's potentially a great deal of data that has to be exchanged between them. It turns out we do a lousy job of using those pipes. Efficiency on connections between data centers is somewhere between 40 and 60 percent, which means we're not using 60 to 40 percent of that connection that we are paying for, right? So one of the really cool things about software-defined networking is it allows you to very carefully manage your bandwidth usage. And Google has some amazing graphs that they show. And they show the bandwidth utilization between their data centers at just about 100%. Okay? And you know, the, the, once again, the chief financial officer is just running around his office yelling at this particular point in time. Because if he's fully utilizing it, that means that he can basically scope it down to just what he needs. He doesn't have to pay for extra unused bandwidth. Okay, uh, this is just simply talking about reactive, proactive. If the router has already seen a particular packet before, it knows what to do with it. Get an 805 packet, it goes out port number five. If it hasn't seen it before, then it comes in and goes, 805, I've never seen it before. Reaches out to the controller and says, hey, I got an 805 packet. What the heck am I supposed to do with it? The controller sees the entire network. It knows exactly where an 805 packet is supposed to go, and it knows exactly where this guy's located in the network. So he'll tell you what port that should go out. So that would be the reactive part. Uh, this is what, so what do I do if I have a, a fault in an SDN network? If I have a fault, I'm going to go, oh no, I've had a fault. I'm going to talk to the controller. The controller sees the entire network. The controller knows exactly what that route that I should build around the fault is. It tells me, I update my tables, and I go on from there. And this is, I think, the last slide I have in my thing just about. So this goes back to that question, and this is a very hot topic. This is a very research lab topic because nobody quite has the answer to it. We anticipate in an SDN network, they get busy, right? Maybe it's during the middle of the day, maybe it's during the middle of the night. So you have a network that's humming along nicely, then all of a sudden the load on the network starts to increase. Well, you let that controller software is so very important, you had better, what, scale it up as the network starts to become important. So you think you probably make multiple copies of it, right? Great. So when do you grow it? How do you hand off? Which routers that controller is handling? Those are sophisticated questions. So you swell up and you grow, you know, spawn multiple copies of that controller. Yay, you're handling your network, everything's fine. And then all that traffic starts to go away. Well, you've got all of these controllers, you don't need them. So now you have to start to shrink the number of controllers that you're using in your network. And as you shrink a controller, you've got to take all the routers that it's responsible for and distribute it over the remaining controllers. Okay? It can all be done. But it is sophisticated stuff, right? And we don't actually have an agreed upon way of doing this yet. So everybody's smart enough to acknowledge that this is something that has to be done, but we're not smart enough yet to know exactly how to do it. And so, you know, there's a lot of open source software out there. Yay, that's great. But when you start to come up with sophisticated solutions to tricky problems like this, this might be where you start to see some proprietary software or proprietary additions to the open source. All right, last slide in the deck. So, great, SDN exists. Google has given it a stamp of approval. We know that at and is out shopping for SDN network and network gear. So clearly, the time for SDN, if it hasn't arrived, it's almost here. It is truly coming. Wouldn't it have been great if somebody could have come to you and said, hey, wow, the internet thing is gonna be really popular, you might wanna find out about it? 
or buy AOL before it gets really expensive. <laughs> Any of those would have been important. So I am telling you, SDN is coming. I'm telling you, SDN is going to be a big deal. There are three issues in the world of SDN that are going to be occupying companies and researchers going forward. First off is interoperability. We've got networks. Thank you very much. Now you've got the shiny new SDN technology. Great. How do I work the shiny new stuff in the old stuff that I already have? Great question. No. We don't have a complete answer right now. Next one, scalability. You know, we're talking about a, a bunch of dumb routers. We're talking about this very important central piece of software. How do I take this from a reasonable size network to a really big size network, such as AT&T's network? How the hell are they going to do that? Don't know. Nobody's really done it. I mean, Google has done a good job. But remember, Google did the safe thing, right? They did their internal inter um, data center network. That's not the big scary network, right? So this is a huge question that we don't have an answer. And then reliability. You know, when you have that centralized piece of software, it had better not fail. But of course, we know it will fail, right? Because everything fails. But what are you going to do when it fails? What's your backup? How do you switch over to something when, they, when it comes back up? How do you switch back to it? Great questions. We understand that those are important questions. We do not have answers to those yet. So if you're interested in anything like this, now is the time to spend some time studying. Now is the time to spend uh, talking to other companies. Because you attended the seminar, you now know more about SDN than 98%, maybe 99% of humanity. So use that information for good. Got a question up here, sir? Yes. How is Cisco responding to this? Okay. So here's an interesting uh, uh, thing. I work for Cisco, so yeah, I'm going to answer that question. Good. Go ahead. All right. Sure. Application century infrastructure. So all that he said, you could look at it as the middle school version of what's really happening. Separation of the data and control plane, fine. But like everything else, and I'll give you the best example I could use. There's all these protocols out there, open standards. OSPF, BGP, and a RIP and a whole bunch. Cisco has a protocol called EIGRP. And on every box that's sold, you can use whatever protocol you use. 80% of people use EIGRP. You made a point earlier that a lot of times open standards or certain protocol have the basic things you need. But the things you really need, usually when they're earlier on, they're one provider that gives you that feature. So you end up using things that are not always so-called open. It may be on everything. So when you look at software-defined networking where it's maturing, the first issue is OPEX reduction, of course. But how do you train your people? How do you do a forklift upgrade? How much will it cost? How do you use your existing infrastructure? So it becomes a migration process. And our approach is application-centric infrastructure, which include a controller that may have open flow on it and multiple other controller protocols. So you could do all the things he's talking about, but the key is how do you manage the applications that are within your network? Because that's usually the most important piece. When you look at all the proliferation of mobile devices within your network, how do you manage that? How do you deal with security, which we haven't talked about yet? So how do you address all these things? Scaling the data center, multiple hypervisor, acquisitions. When you buy a company that might be using uh, Microsoft uh, Hyper-V, and you have VMware using something else, how do you put them together? So we're looking at it from a much higher level than just the basic network. As a matter of fact, when they did the first test at Stanford, they borrowed Cisco equipment to do that. So since Cisco was mentioned so much, we have our approach. What we'll ask for is to get some time to give our version that of true. what's next. So in the, in the world of hardware of vendors, okay, there are, well, every vendor by now has an SDM story to tell. And Cisco certainly does have theirs. They've raised it up. Um, 
Once again, and a Cisco employee who's probably very uh, intimately familiar with theirs. From a third person point of view, looking at what the industry is saying, Cisco's approach is tied to hardware. Okay, so the way they're implementing their SDF does have a relation to the hardware. This is different from some other vendors who are more hardware agnostic. Okay? An example of that is VMware, the folks who do the virtualization. They have come on very strong in the SDN space. They have a very interesting solution, which is quite obviously all software based. Okay? Juniper is also out there. Juniper is a little confused right now. They have stated what they're doing, they've become a, a, an active part of some open source efforts and stuff like that. They just switched out their CEO, who knows if they're gonna make some changes and stuff like that. But every single company, let's say, has their own approach to SDN right now. And the market has not decided what it wants to do. Yeah, it's because Oracle. people have made the purchases. Is Oracle in the business of SDN? In the world of SDN, not that I'm aware. They don't think so, because they'll be more of an application that runs on top of the network, okay? So they won't actually be providing network gear. Brocade, Cisco, Juniper, HP, <coughs> IBM, those are all the names that you see in this space. But now they came with a virtual machine, open source. So I was guessing probably that they're getting into the SDN also. Every, it was, in the port of virtualization. And once again, the beauty of SDN is that you're basically virtualizing the network. Okay? So you're stepping away from the hardware, you're creating a software model of it, you can manipulate that software model, and as you manipulate that model, then it gets related back to the physical network and the changes occur. Right? Which is an incredibly sophisticated way to do it, and it is a great tool. All right? Question? Yes, sir. Sitting there, not being productive. That is exactly. The networks are flawed. The carriers are running out of WDM space. They need more channel space for additional growth. They can't get more additional revenues because they don't have any more channel space to sell. So they have to have a way to start um, providing services on a demand basis. Verizon has actually been pretty open about some of the initial steps they've taken with SDF. And one of the places that this feels right in line with what you're saying about the importance of bandwidth and the ability to manage it, Verizon's using um, SDN to determine, you know, they take a look and see what your uh, your end device is that you're watching a video on. Is it a laptop? Is it a tablet? Is it a cell phone? And then based on the type of device that you're using, they're using their SDN network to set up a connection to you that will be appropriate for that device, right? It gives them a chance to scale back the amount of bandwidth that they're using to support you, but you're happy because you're watching on your cell, you know, you're watching hockey on your cell phone, right? And it's good enough for you. If you're watching on your laptop, it might, you know, be jerky or jaggy or something like that. But you're happy, and they're happy because they're not using nearly as much bandwidth as they would otherwise, right? And the SDN gives them the sophistication that they can manage the type of bandwidth and type of connection that they offer to you. It should be a huge cost savings. Yes. Now, admittedly, you got to get there. Yeah. And that's the challenge, right? All right. I've probably used up my time with you guys tonight. Yeah, Are there any questions before we wrap things up tonight? Going once. What's next? That's a TV. Because this is cutting edge, all right? There certainly is something that, actually, and I'll tell you, I will actually yeah. tell you exactly what's next. It's up at that control plane. Okay, so there's this, what we talked about right now was nuts and bolts, right? I mean, this is how you put a network together. This is how you get routers to talk to each other. This is this is plain vanilla stuff. Okay, the exciting stuff going forward is going to happen at that control plane, where you've got some software folks going, wait, you're going to present to me a complete network, a complete description of the network, and I can through software manipulate that any way I want. One of the cool examples I saw of that was if I'm going to take a server down to do maintenance on it, I can, through software, say, don't route anything to that server. And it all just goes away magically. Then I just unplug it, stick a new one in, and I go back and say, start routing stuff to that server. And then magically, it just starts happening. Today, I'd have to visit each router that was interconnected. And all but yeah, no, so that was just a cool example, right? Exactly. That's a, 
you know, could do a time and date based on all sorts of things. So once again, don't want to take it too much time. Folks, thank you so much for coming out. You have an evaluation form. The evaluation form only has two questions on it. I need you to complete the two questions. Leave it on the table by the door before you leave. What it does is it allows me to make our next seminar that much better. So if you'll take just a brief moment to do that, what's our cookie supply looking? Guys, I'd like to congratulate you. have done pretty good. You're driving home. All sorts of stuff could happen on the way home. Flat tires. Your battery could go bad. Uh, you could get sleepy. All sorts of things could happen. Take at least two cookies. <laughs> you could potentially take four or more. Five if you use your mouth. But let's make sure you leave with cookies, and I will be happy. Thank you so much for coming out, guys. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great evening. Great Safe good. travels, guys. You might be asking yourself, where do I go from here? The ability to effectively manage an IT department and to do it well is a skill that your company needs you to have. It sure makes sense to invest the time and energy that it takes to become a great CIO. A simple way to start doing this is to sign up for the free The Accidental Successful CIO newsletter. This monthly publication is sent to your inbox and is overflowing with tips and techniques on how you can spend your time making the right IT decisions and really leading your department's IT professionals. We'll cover how to evaluate new technologies, how to foster relationships with other parts of the business, how to hire the right staff, how to work with the CEO so he understands just how critical IT is to his and the company's success, and we might even cover a few CIO career tips or two. Hey, the newsletter is free, so you can't go wrong there. In the description of this video, you'll find a link that you can click on. Go ahead and click on it, and you'll be taken to a web page that will let you sign up for the newsletter. There's even a free gift in it for you when you do. Thanks for watching this video. Sign up for the newsletter, and congratulations on starting your journey to accidentally becoming a successful CIO.